from the Partnership for Environment and Disaster Risk Reduction, this is Talks for Action, a podcast about how we can work together with nature to build resilience against disasters and climate change. Talks for Action will bring you on a journey to highlight how nature is playing an important role from the climate talks at COP26 in Glasgow last year to the Global Platform for Disaster Risk Reduction in 2022. Each Talks for Action episode will focus on different ways that nature-based solutions contribute to increasing disaster and climate resilience. You will hear a wide range of perspectives from around the world on how nature is being applied as a solution to the pressing climate and disaster issues. From voices from the field to humanitarian perspectives and UN climate advisors. On your commute to work, your morning run, or over a cup of tea, listen in and learn something new about how to work with nature in addressing one of our most pressing issues today, the climate and disaster emergency. Okay, welcome. Today um, we are holding this podcast in honor of International Women's Day, which is held on the 8th of March. The theme of this year's uh, International Women's uh, Day is breaking the bias. And so we will really be talking about, uh, in today's podcast, about nature-based solutions and gender issues. I have with me today two guests. Our first guest is Marian Icheduna, who has been working for the last eight years in development, sharing her expertise on catchment-based integrated water resource management. Currently, Marion is working with Care International in Uganda, where she manages a consortium under the Partners for Resilience Alliance, comprised of Care, CoreAid and Whitlands International, implementing a unit-funded project on upscaling community resilience through ecosystem-based disaster risk reduction and adaptation. So welcome, Marion. It's really good to have you uh, here today. It's a pleasure. Thank you. And our second guest is uh, Veronica Ruiz Garcia, who is the program manager for ecosystem-based disaster risk reduction um, at IUCN. Uh, She supports IUCN's global work on nature-based solutions for societal challenges towards a coordinated approach to applying ecosystem-based management to climate change and disaster risk reduction. She also supports the expansion of IUCN's Climate and Disaster Resilience Project portfolio by facilitating collaborations plus trusted partnership building. So welcome, uh, Veronica. Thank you, Natalie, and also my pleasure to be here today with uh, Marianne in this uh, podcast. Uh, It's really wonderful to have uh, two women working on these important issues of uh, nature-based solutions. So today, our first question, um, should probably be for for both of you, is um, in your field of working on nature-based solutions, Now, what what do you see? How can we um, try and break some of these gender biases uh, that occur? I don't know if Marion would like to start. Um, Thank you so much, Natalie, and a very uh, good question there. But um, I think before we even go to what we can possibly do, I think for me, it is quite important for us to understand what these biases are and Mm -hmm. why they exist. And so I would like to bring you in the context of Uganda, and particularly in the northern part of Uganda, where we are implementing the Ecodiral project. And some of the narratives around the biases that exist include, among others, that women are not supposed to own land. And this is both uh, from their matrimonial homes, but also from their patrimonial homes. Uh, The second narrative of bias that I would like to share with you is the narrative around women are supposed to be caregivers. And this derails the whole right of women as individuals that are supposed to contribute to the development. And thirdly, but not lastly, uh, the narrative around women depending on men economically. So looking at all these three uh, biases and coming back to your question, uh, Natalie, about what we can uh, possibly do to break the bias, uh, I would like to uh, say uh, about three things. Uh, Firstly, uh, and from the experience of the project that we are running in this part of the country, 
uh, the issue around deliberately creating spaces for women uh, um, to be able to, to, to be able to thrive as leaders is very critical. And this is because we are bringing then women closer to where the decisions are being taken. And we are kind of trying to empower women to be able to speak up to some of these uh, biases. Um, secondly, uh, the aspect around economic empowerment. And in this case, we are speaking about uh, eco-based solutions or nature-based solutions, businesses that thrive around eco-based solutions that empower women economically. And once they are empowered economically, then they are able to actually even come uh, closer to where the decisions are taking place. The last but most important one is the aspect of engaging men and boys. Um, this is also because when we talk about the productive uh, assets like land and other natural resources, they're predominantly uh, owned by men, they're controlled by men. So the access, control and ownership of these productive assets is limited by the women. However, when we engage men and boys, then we are coming into a dialogue uh, for the appreciation of the fact that the men can support the women to grow uh, economically and get engaged in productive work that can then um, you know, improve them as being productive. So I will stop at that for now. Um, and thank you, over. Great, thank you very much, uh, Marianne. Yes, I, I, I mean, I can really hear the, the, a lot of work that you're undertaking in terms of empowerment, uh, giving a voice to these women, helping them thrive economically. And I think it's really important that part of, you know, making sure that everyone comes into that discussion, not just the women, but the women and, and men. Um, so thank, thank you for that. I wonder if uh, Veronica, if you would like to add something. Yeah, and I fully agree really with uh, with what Marion just mentioned and you you emphasize as well, Natalie. I think it's, it's not only about women. We tend to focus on women, but I will say like it is for both, for women and men, right? And all of those who feel they belong to another gender mm -hmm. need, really need to come as the stronger leaders and really bring up this empowerment and take on. We, I, I think we are on a, moment, on a moment that we need to take on on an extra work right besides of all the work do, we are we doing because this extra work is when it comes to gender inclusion and um, for this, this is critical to support our teams the teams we work with the actors we work with as well to be able to advance in diversity equity and inclusion efforts but if i if i consider my situation also as a young woman we have a sort of an unconscious bias means that young women are consistently, we are consistently underestimated and overlooked uh, right from the outset of our careers, right? So that's what I really feel like organizations need to implement the stronger objective and transparent talent management practices, you know, because we need to guard against unconscious bias. Sometimes we really not realize we are on meetings and then when we finish a meeting, meeting is when we realize what this uh, bias. So if we don't put the system in place, it will be difficult to, to deal with the uh, cumulative and costly, uh, costly effect as well for young women who are denied access to critical developmental opportunities, but as for organization as well to fail to recognize and develop top talent. This could be in the sense of organization and Marion, she was more building into the community level. But I will say in terms of also, also of nature based solutions, in taking that right based approach means that nature based solutions should be grounded in human rights and aim to promote and protect human rights for mm -hmm. both again women, men, but also any other gender. It should be particularly attention to those, especially the ones facing the inequalities and the most great barriers to contribution. And it should really, we need to consider when talking about nature-based solutions to really use and embrace gender responsive and inclusive approaches. Not only sensitive, because we tend now to use the word sensitive, but really responsive. We need to respond to the challenges we are facing. And it is not a question of confronting 
women and men, right? It's not assigning women greater responsibility for environmental rehabilitation, restoration or other practices, but it's by combining efforts to achieve a better, a happier and a more peaceful society, especially now that we are facing a war here in, in Europe. So for this, I think we really need public and institutional recognition of women role in natural resource management, in nature-based solutions management, and other topics related like environmental protection, etc. So I think this is really important, and I really feel it is critical also supporting the visibility of women's roles and of participation, representation, leadership, but also the unlocking access to information, what Marion was mentioning as well. We need to get access to tra uh, trainings, to tools. We need to improve also the equitable access to, to financial tools as, as well. Great, thank you, Veronica. You know, also I think you complemented uh, your answer, complemented Marion really well. And um, it's true, one really does forget about that hidden bias. Uh, you know, that that one it, that becomes so natural in society, and that is something that I think organisations, you know, they may have a gender plan, but they must need to make sure that they actually implement it, that they look at themselves in a critical way, um, so that you know, equality. Um, in all of these and 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 um, can really be there. So it's really a, a creating a equal rights for everyone. And I definitely second the importance. And it's true, it's not mentioned enough, maybe, but the importance of a rights based approach uh, when we are um, working with uh, nature based solutions. So anyway, thank you. So I'm going to move to my, my second question, since, uh, you know, both of you have worked in different capacities on uh, EcoDRR and nature-based solutions. I was wondering if you would like to share any inspiring stories from the field of women working in some way or another um, on nature-based solutions for disaster and climate resilience. Yeah, well, uh, thank you so much. And thank you, Veronica, for those very insightful uh, additions to the discussion. Very exciting indeed. Um, in terms of the stories, uh, I, I would like to share an inspiring story of um, a 39-year-old woman uh, who lives in Otudu village. Otudu village is one of the last mile communities uh, in northern Uganda. And in recent times, uh, this village has suffered uh, a lot of uh, climatic hazards which have increased in frequency, particularly in terms of floods and drought. And this has kind of crippled the local economy, um, co compounded by, of course, as we all know, the, the, the impact of the pandemic, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And so um, Colin, um, being a part of a group that is being supported by the ECHO DRR project, um, recently uh, got involved in um, a, a, a small project to produce vegetables in a rocking long drought period. And, and to do this, uh, Pauline was part of a group that were conserving a wetland ecosystem. And the whole idea was to ensure that the wetland ecosystem had uh, water throughout the year for the group to access in terms of household basic uh, water needs, but also, and most importantly, to be able to grow uh, crops during this uh, dry period. And so um, this is quite interesting uh, because uh, looking at the fact that uh, Polly, sorry, Colin, from the uh, fact that she's a woman, does not own land, but was supported by her husband, um, who is not part of the group, but through the male engaged approach, he appreciated and supported Polly to grow uh, vegetables. As I speak, uh, Polly was able to harvest about five bags of vegetable in a very hot, dry period and earned herself about 100,000 Uganda shillings, this is about um, 30 US uh, dollars. And with this, uh, Polly was incentivized to conserve the wetland ecosystem even more, but it was also a trigger to the other adjacent communities to realize that indeed it's possible to work around um, nature and be able to thrive uh, in the middle of such um, a rocking crisis uh, or prolonged uh, drought. And so uh, Polly and the others in this group 
um, have really embraced the approach of, of conserving ecosystems that in the end pay in terms of improving on their livelihoods in times of crisis, particularly in these periods where we have um, double, if not triple uh, crisis compounded with COVID-19. And so Polly shares her success story, not only with the community groups, but even as she goes to engage with the local leadership as a woman leader. And so we interestingly got comments from the leadership as well as being proud to be part of a project that actually transforms uh, the livelihoods of the local communities and tagging this around ecosystems. I felt I should share that because it is one of those that uh, come through in a moment when we are dealing with crisis and trying to demonstrate um, how nature based solutions can actually enable last mile communities to sail through um, the climate crisis, but also other um, uh, crises. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Marion. It really does illustrate, you know, the resilience um, and um, also the work of, of these women and communities who are working, you know, going through this crisis, improving the environment whilst, you know, um, managing to, to to get their needs met and their livelihoods um, and, you know, are feeling empowered and also yeah, it's, it's a very inspiring story. Thank you very much, uh, Marion. Turn now to Veronica. Yeah, indeed, it's really women are crucial when it comes to accelerating uh, the implementation of nature-based solution. In this case, Marion, ecosystem-based disaster reduction. And really, they deeply rely on the environment to support their livelihoods. This is women, they play a very important role. So talking about me as part of IUCN, IUCN has multiple examples, but there is one who really, I, I'm still fascinated every time when I think about when I went in 2019, 18, sorry, just before the pandemic, uh, to Nepal to visit one of our sites for one of the projects. Project that is called Scaling Up Mountain Ecosystem Based Adaptation. So one of the pro one of the site is in the uh, Pan Panchase region in Nepal. So the situation here in Panchase is a bit of unique because you see there are like people coming from all over the world for going there, doing some trekking in the mountains, but at the same time is unique because it, in respect to to um, the old migration that is happening in this area and high percentage of, of men, they are moving for foreign rural areas, going into the, the urban areas, which means that all the women living in those communities in the high, high mountains, they are staying there alone, and they have to really manage the entire community, also to really make sure that they can get their livelihoods, but at the same time, they can protect the children that are living over there. So. This project is, was a, it was kind of a mix of how women can really make the leadership on all these different activities. So there is a project that is missing, it's mixing like a sustainable agricultural practices that are really coordinated by women, but at the same time they are doing a slope protection and doing conservation of their slope. But at the same time, there are also some, let's say, ecotourism uh, practices where they have some um, some houses that uh, tourists they can come, they can stay there, and they can also learn from what the women are doing in the communities. And you can be part of that as well at the same time. For example, doing some beekeeping or learning more about uh, med uh, medicinal uh, plants. So really was like wonderful to see like how all these women they are really protecting their communities, but not only the communities, but protecting the knowledge to keep these. Uh, let's say legacy for the children and um, one day maybe the children they move they will move as well to the cities but this legacy will uh, will remain in there so for me it was wonderful I can sometimes I, I remember the I remember the pictures with all these kids and the women and it's just wonderful to see like how the necessity is bringing them to reach this point like they have to be resilient then is a there is not a plan b there is only a plan a so they have to move forward and move together in this case uh, as a community so that's why i really feel that 
women are crucial, really they are crucial. And also what Marion said, like empowering women and increasing their capacities to develop or get involved in these type of projects, we'll say Nature Web Solutions or other, will really help provide security, whether that is in, in the means of food, income or security, in terms of self-security. But really, women across the world are often deeply connected to the management of the land. So we really need to think about what is the role the women are playing worldwide. You know, thank you, Veronica. Uh, you know, so it was very heartwarming, and also, you know, really feel that you had uh, such good memories from that mm-hmm. time there. Um, you know, it's just also it's always amazing when you you meet with a group of women who are, you know, just so inspiring. And I think this is uh, definitely the same as with Marion. You know, these these are very inspiring stories, and just show the world that you know women and all are a valuable and important part. Um, of this world and have a contribution to make equally. Coming towards the end, I'm going to have one last question for you both. And this time, a little bit more focus on both of you, since you're um, both women working in this field. We also have had to had of our own um, challenges um, with, you know, gender um, biases. So at the same time, maybe it'd be great to hear if you would like is what have been some of your greatest challenges, but also your achievements. Thank you so much, Natalie, and thank you, uh, Veronica. Quite exciting to speak uh, to me as a woman and uh, particularly on the challenges that uh, we face in this sector. And I would like to build on from what Veronica highlighted in terms of um, the aspect of gender equity and diversity at the workplace, but maybe also picking it from way back when we, uh, when I was still a student and pursuing, um, you know, studies around environment and natural resources. Of course, the biases around uh, women going for such courses, first of all, and I will put it clearly that um, in Uganda, for example, there are very uh, few women in this sector. It's predominantly a male sector. And so, you know, it comes with a lot of challenges because um, the sector uh, mainly implements activities in last mile communities. And you can imagine what that means for, uh, for example, uh, a mother like me that has to, you know, move away and work from afar and, you know, be able to actually deliver um, a program or lead a consortia and be able to see that uh, we achieve the impact that we desire to see. And so uh, for me, really, the the challenges are both, um, you know, within a male dominated sector to challenge certain um, uh, norms and biases, but also around the work environment, dealing with last mile communities and implementing these kinds of work. Uh, But I'll say that um, indeed building on to the gender equity and diversity approach, particularly I think CARE has been able to uh, encourage women and, you know, build a more um, leadership Um, uh, with women. I'll particularly say as a person I've benefited from a program on African women leadership that is being spearheaded by CARE. And in this program, indeed, it it kind of uh, empowers me as a woman to actually stand out, to be able to present myself with confidence uh, within the sector. And, And for me, I think this has actually contributed to how much I fit uh, within the sector. In terms of achievements, uh, of course, um, it lies in really the kind of uh, work that we've been able to deliver, particularly ensuring that there is balance delivery of these activities between, you know, the men and the women, the vulnerable men and women that we support. And, you know, trying to challenge uh, some of the policy uh, aspects to the extent possible that actually uh, inform uh, how women or men are able to benefit uh, from this. I'll particularly give an example in terms of the kind of uh, groups or structures of, of communities that we work with. By default, usually when we are constituting some of the groups, some of these positions are naturally male dominated because the leadership positions in terms of the political leadership is predominantly male. And so some policies uh, from a ministry 
kind of target existing um, positions. And so you end up having a male dominated structure. So we've been able to kind of, you know, break through with this, especially at levels where we have the sphere of control to bring more women, to empower more women. And so building capacities and assets of these women to be able to be leaders and thrive in these spaces. For me, I think that is one of the key achievements that I celebrate to see women at all these levels, even including um, levels where you least expect um, women to come out and, and, and feel confident to participate in environment and natural resource uh, conversation. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Marion. You know, you're really, I think, inspiring and showing the, the women of, of today that, you know, it is possible and we are breaking the bias. And also, aside from breaking the bias, it's also breaking that glass ceiling. You know, you can get to, to positions of leadership and we can work towards that. So it's really great to hear. Thank you. Veronica? I have to say, my case, it was the opposite. Uh, when, I, when I was studying, we were like more women than men when I was studying um, my Bachelor of bi on Biology, but it doesn't mean that it was easier for me afterwards. <laughs> it didn't mean that. So I have to say, like, we, it, taking this, uh, this question a bit of more personal, and talking about my personal career or my professional path, for me, the first thing was so, when it was really difficult for me, and I, I think this is a still, I, I still feel this uh, transparent pressure, social pressure, is the fact of like, for example, I was the first one on my family having an university degree. How are you going to the university, but uh, you, you should be taking care of the house or you should find a husband, right? Even though I come from Spain, which you can tell now, oh, still, no? Europe. But... Um, was the decision, no? I want to, this is what I want to do, and nothing will stop me, right? And there I am now working in uh, IUCN, a well-recognized organization, working with partners like uh, uh, Natalie from UNEP or you, Marion, colleagues working on CARE. So this is this is sort of like a, a challenge, right? Like uh, why I have to stop my dreams? Which are the barriers, right? Or, or these are sometimes I feel like our self, we put our own barriers because of all these biases. Similarly, I have to say like, um, yeah, despite all the ups and downs, I'm, I'm in here and all of us, we are here today having this conversation, the three of us together. But I think also I will say my biggest struggle and I can say like uh, with conversation with other uh, colleagues and, um, and friends, I think they have the same struggle is to quantify our success and to acknowledge how we are contributing to this change. Sometimes we feel like uh, we are not contributing. We are just going with the flow. And I think this is uh, one of the most challenge, one of the challenges that I face em even every morning. I'm asking to myself, what I'm doing here? And also it's maybe because we don't have that space not to feel that we are part of the change and we are working all together and making an opportunity for us, but for the, the girls and the women that are coming after after us. And an achievement, I have to say, I'm pretty proud of the last year where, where I am now, but to have been able to connect with wonderful people and to us as a very important pillar of my daily uh, work is to get to create networks and to bring together different people coming from different sectors, from different nationalities, for different ethnies, for different genders. And I think this is one of the achievements that I'm proud of, and I hope I can keep working in the same way for the coming years. But I think this is very important. Coming back to what I said at the beginning, it's not only about women, it is about men, women and any other gender that we really need to work together for an uh, equitable work and um, an inclusive work society, let's say. Great. Thank you, Veronica. It's true that, uh, you know, a part of also biases of women is, is, is facing a lot of outside and cultural pressure. Um, that they kind of have to contend with at the same time trying to get into the, the work that they would like to and be leaders in their fields and then also you know getting the recognition for that which um, sometimes that uh, you are right you know or sometimes the recognition does not go to the woman behind the man and it's 
we see that a lot with um, you know Nobel Prize win in the past. Maybe not so much now, but in the past, you know, famous women have discovered things, but actually it's the men who have received the recognition. But I think you know you are both of you helping to to turn the tide in your work, and you know it is clear that. Also, in such an important aspect of nature based solutions, you know, um, both of you and all of us, I mean, I guess I'm part of it, we are aiming to try to, to break this bias and, uh, as you say, so eloquently, you know, make sure we have a, an, an equal and, and, but it's also rights based uh, society in the future. So, now I'd like to thank both of you very much um, for our discussion today. Thank you to you, Natalie, as well, and to Mario. Nice to meet you as well. It was a pleasure meeting both of you. Great. Thank you. You've just listened to Talks for Action, a podcast brought to you by the Partnership for Environment and Disaster Risk Reduction. If you are interested in learning more about nature-based solutions for disaster and climate resilience, please follow our free online course on www.peder.org forward slash MOOC. I repeat, www.peder.org forward slash M-O-O-C. Until next month for the next episode, stay tuned.